Welcome to Seven Figure Small, the podcast that brings you the stories and strategies that are driving the growing number of solo businesses achieving seven figures in revenue without investors or employees. Here are your hosts for this edition of Seven Figure Small, serial digital entrepreneur Brian Clark and me, Jared Morris. All right, Brian. So we are recording this on Friday, a couple days before the Super Bowl. Uh, so when people listen to this, they're going to know the answer to this question. But I'm curious if you made a final decision yet on whether you're going to buy a Super Bowl ad to drive traffic to further, or if you decided that that wasn't a good investment of your seven-figure earnings. You know, if I didn't have to pay you... <laughs> I could have pulled off Boy, the Super Bowl. I wish ad. that was the difference. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yeah, that would be a good problem for both of us, actually. Um, okay, but that, that does actually present an interesting question. Like, Not that you would ever do it, but let's say that you had a Super Bowl spot to, to advertise a curated newsletter. Like what would be what what would off the top of your head, like how would you utilize that time, that space? Well, that'd be a terrible idea at at those prices. So sure. Start sure. there. But if you just had I, that time and the, that that number of it, eyeballs. Yeah. Well you you've gotta you've gotta make it a response driven advertisement. You've gotta have a very clear message, very clear call to action and send them exactly where you want them to go and tell them what you want them to do. I mean that's how direct response advertising works, whether it be uh, print, radio, television. So, yeah, I take my best shot at it. <laughs> I mean, with that kind of crowd, you know, it probably would work to some degree. Um, again, if you made it very clear who it was for, which means excluding probably 70% of the audience, but that's okay. Yeah, that is okay. So that, you know, kicks off this conversation that we're going to have about audience and it's interesting because you know the the Super Bowl is the biggest audience the you know the biggest single event audience for you know for a television show um that that you know that you get throughout the year and you know this topic of audience and and you know what constitutes the amount of audience that folks need for the kinds of things that we're teaching them how to do this is a constant topic of conversation i just got done doing a and a inside of the unemployable initiative and i think out of the 10 questions three of them were about audience you know how big of an audience do you need to launch a community what do you need to do to build an audience for a podcast you know how how do you gauge how you're building your audience for your curated newsletter i mean it was just so many questions about audience so let's spend some time talking today about audience and about you know what a minimum viable audience is, which I think you know most people probably know, but we can certainly provide a refresher. And then how to know when you actually have one, because that seems to be the question that we get the or at least one of the questions that I get the most. Yeah, and those are good questions, uh, much better questions than I see people ultimately or initially, I should say, focusing on how big an audience they want to end up with. And I think that's a little bit missing the point. It's a bit of an abstraction. Like you can, you see various people and their size of audience and all of a sudden you think, well, that's the size of audience I need, which is often sometimes in the hundreds of thousands. And of course, that's not true at all. Um, and I think it can be uh, detrimental to focus on those kind of numbers when you're getting started because it can seem especially when it's kind of slow going at the beginning, and it always is, that you get discouraged and you just figure, well, I'm never going to succeed because I'm never going to get into six figures. And that's not necessarily the goal at all, ever. Um, but it's certainly not your goal at the beginning. More important than anything is figuring out the type of person that you want in your audience. And ultimately, that will determine how much uh, value you can deliver to that audience and how much value can be returned to you in turn, you know, based on who they are and what they want. I mean, you can have an audience of a thousand people. And if the price point is high enough, and for example, in certain B2B industries, that's more than enough, right? So it's all relative and it's all tied to the specifics 
of your your own audience. So I was thinking about this topic, you know, because again, as you say, it's it's the question that people ask in various ways over and over and over again. So I go to this gym here in Boulder. It's a small gym. It's one of these, um, you know, 24 hour remote access place. It's only like 4,000 square feet. So it's not like a 24 hour gym or some super gym like that. It's a little place. Um, but you can go anytime you want. You have a little fob, you go in. And, um, I was thinking as I watched, uh, the owners who are also personal trainers, it occurred to me, I'm like, what's the best way, you know, or, or what's a very, uh, bricks and mortars way to start a personal training business? Well, easy, just buy yourself a gym, <laughs> right? And yeah. no, that sounds, that sounds crazy <laughs> at first because you're like, well, yeah, that is very capital intensive or what. But think about it. That's a good analogy to what we do when we build audiences, but way less money, way less risk, all of that. But effectively, these people own this small gym and people join the gym. That's kind of their baseline audience. And then you can imagine that uh, they add to their profits, you know, typical stuff. They sell supplements um, and, and related stuff, not a ton of merchandise, but they do offer personal training services. It's even on the sign outside. So that was in their thoughts. Obviously, uh, if you break even on the gym, you make your profit off personal training. Okay. A lot of business models work that way. So if you want to take the analogy further, if you don't have a minimum viable level of people joining that gym where you're not even breaking even on that high rent. And, and trust me, in Boulder, they're paying some rent um, unless they own the building. Even then, that, that real estate's very expensive. Um, so they're not, they don't have a viable business at that point. But if you do manage to just get, get broke even on memberships, that, that tells you a, a certain amount of things about the foot traffic in that gym. And the ability to get to know the people in the audience, right? Figure out what their individual needs are and then supply it through personal training services, through uh, supplements, through nutrition advice, all of this type of thing. And it struck me that that is incredibly similar to what we do with online audience building. Um, but, but it puts it in perspective for you that this is so much less riskier. And so much more lucrative than you could ever make in that very expensive, uh, very high risk when you look at it type of business. But that's that's kind of a classic business model. And so we're taking it here and we're building an audience, trying to figure out exactly the type of people that we want to attract. Once they show up, that's when the real learning happens and we determine what's their pain, what's their problems, what's their desires. And then we're able to develop products and services that match up with them perfectly as a group of people, not as a market abstraction. You know, it's, it's, it's a very real thing when you're serving real people. So that's kind of the, the best way to think about what a minimum viable audience is. Uh, effectively, you have an MBA when you're, number one, you're receiving enough feedback from that audience whether you're soliciting it directly through surveys or just saying, hey, reply to this email and tell me what you think. Could be comments on blog posts, uh, replies to emails, social media chatter, uh, you know, just all these ways that you receive information back from this real group of people and you're able to adapt and evolve your content to better serve the audience. Number two, and this is a big one because that struggle to get to this point all starts to pay off when you're growing your audience organically, thanks to people effectively sharing your newsletter, for example. On further, my biggest source of new subscriptions comes from the ambiguous direct, right? When you don't know where they're coming from, but it's such a large number of traffic, 
and such a high number of relative conversions to other sur- sources, you know what it is. It's Gen Xers forwarding it to other Gen Xers because it resonates with them and they want to share it. It says something about them as much as it says something about you know the service that I'm providing. And that's where you're really hitting that s- sweet spot where the audience starts growing itself. And then finally, and this is a big part that we're really turning the normal process of product development or startup companies on its head, which is you're gaining enough insight into what the audience needs to solve their problems or satisfy their desires beyond the free education you're providing or the free content, right? So at that point, you're like, oh, this is what I need to sell. And you know, with a high degree of confidence that that's what they will buy, as opposed to the other model, which is you dream something up that you think is cool, or you think people ought to buy, and they don't. And that is why most startups fail. Going back to your analogy, which I thought was a really interesting one, in that analogy with the gym, the folks who own the gym They've got to have enough, as you said, they've got to have enough customers coming in to kind of cover those costs. But when we're talking about a minimum viable audience, just to be clear, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you have to be gaining enough revenue from these people yet, right? Because as you just laid out in all three of those, you're, you need a big enough audience so that you can learn from folks and understand what the problems are and, and figure out what to sell them. But this can actually be before you're actually making money, before you're making revenue. No, it is. I mean, go back to the beginning of Copy Blogger. I went 18 months, but it's a complete, that's where the bricks and mortar analogy breaks down. If you're not charging people in that model right away, you don't make it, right? Yeah. That's the beautiful thing about audience building in the digital environment, which is it is super low cost, almost, you know, minuscule to, start building an audience, uh, especially with the process of curation where you're not even, you know, spending a lot of time, which is the equivalent of money. You know, you either spend time or money in order to get it done. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the beauty of, of this business model. I mean, and you tell people that, okay, I built an eight figure company this way. I, I launched three, seven figure startups this way. And again, what does that gym owner make a year? A hundred grand, maybe. I mean, you know, it's tough in the real world, (laughs) but that's the beauty of audience. You know, we've been talking the last few episodes about, you know, sometimes scale is, is the opposite of success. And we've been talking about, you know, Jeff Goins, who basically is like, I'm just going to work with less people to, to have more satisfaction and yet it's not going to cause me to severely limit the amount of money I make because it's about the value I can deliver to this smaller group of a certain type of person otherwise. Um, so you're right. Uh, it's not. That's where – This is here's the reason why I've never opened a bricks and mortar business, Jared. So I think you just hit that one right <laughs> on the head. I mean, I'm spoiled rotten. Uh, I, I can't even imagine that people work so hard, take that much risk, and the return is relatively small. So, yeah. How has building a minimum viable audience changed? Because, you know, obviously there's the organic way to build it, and you have to be very patient that way. And to a certain extent, you know, building a minimum viable audience the right way is, is always an organic process. But there are ways now to potentially speed it up if you're smart about it and you have some money to invest, you know, like using paid ads to get attention on what you're doing. How has it changed and how do you think people should view some of these other ways now that they have to kind of speed the process up? Yeah, things have have really changed drastically. I mean, I catch myself reflecting on pre-2010 and man, how blessed were we for that free-for-all of early social media. I mean you know, I can just remember just coming up with a topic for an article, uh, matching it with a headline, making it the best I could make it. And then, um, basically posting it, uh, someone, you know, back in those days you had the, this, what were the dig influencers called? The ones 
power you dig power yeah, users. power users yeah 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 and so you became friends with those guys and i was, was in some of those all, circles <laughs> it was almost all guys I, i'm not using <laughs> yeah. that generically and uh and then they'd submit it for you. And next thing you know, you were trying to keep your servers up for the rest of the day. I mean, it was just <laughs> so different. Um, and it was really imprecise when you think about it. I remember also, you know, for every subscriber that we'd gain through those massive bursts of traffic, we'd have 15 little haters telling us we sucked. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just, you know, because you're, you're just, exp- you're not, laser targeted to- toward the type of people that you've determined you want to attract. Um, it was more just, it was, it was really like the transition between mass media and where we are today uh, in those days of kind of viral organic social media traffic. And then of course, all the links you got from other bloggers when you made the dig homepage. And of course that, you know, enhances the SEO and authority of the site. So it was a magical time that is long gone. And, but ne- but the upside is, you're right, uh, social advertising is very inexpensive, again, compared to television, radio, billboards, almost anything you can think of as legacy advertising or or media. And it's so incredibly targeted um, it's scary to a, to a certain degree. And we've seen the downside of that, but the upside of it is if you can do the work up front and say, this is the type of person I want to serve. You're not accepting whoever should just whoever shows up. You're like, these are the people that are my perfect match. And then you do some small experiments, attracting those people, five bucks in Facebook ads, 10 bucks, you know, if that works out, get a a small group. And if you're on the right path, then you can spend your way to a point uh, that we call the minimum viable audience. And again, it meets those three criteria that I I just went over. And at that point, once you understand um, that the audience starts growing itself, so you're saving money there, that is the redeeming organic aspect of audience building. It still happens. And I love the fact that it happens through email forwards, which is how it used to happen in the late nineties, you know, back when everyone forwarded everything and you're like, please stop. But now (laughs) if someone forwards something to you and says, Hey, you should check this out. You take it seriously because people don't forward just casually anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, They don't just necessarily rave about you on social media casually. That was something that happened much more often early on. So uh, it still happens. Um, You just have to really focus on who you're serving and the value that they're looking for. Um, But yeah, I, and and it's, here's another thing. If you're a straight up entrepreneur and you want to do the audience first, first approach, like we um, recommend, then yeah, I think you're going to have to uh, do, do your homework and then invest a little bit of money, not huge amounts because you're only trying to get to this point. You're not trying to say, okay, I have a hundred thousand dollars. How can I, can I build an audience of 50,000, 25,000? No, you don't want to do that. As an example, uh, we created a a product for unemployable with an email list of less than 4,000 people. And I, I think that still blows people's mind and they don't really want to believe that, but that's, that was a minimum viable audience for us. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not about the size of the audience. It's about the quality of the feedback and the and your perception of, do I get this group of people or not? And then once you do that, and then you're able to launch something and it actually sells, then you can invest money that you're bringing in through revenue in order to attract more of the same type of person. You don't just go, hey, everyone. Come on in now. No, that would be a huge mistake, but I see people doing that as well. And one more thing, if you're currently a freelancer working with clients, if you can somehow create your area of authority that that complements what you're already providing as a client service provider, 
then you have great ROI advertising potential right now because client services, you, you charge much more than if you're selling an ebook or a course or what have you. Um, so that is my favorite way to go about it. If you're early on, almost everyone starts out as a freelancer or a consultant before they move into products, right? So if you can build an audience first that grows your existing business, you're making a profit while building the audience. And then the audience tells you the product they want to buy. And that to me is a, a perfect scenario because you're not necessarily coming out of pocket if you can advertise and get a return through your existing business right now. You talked about the power of, you know, once the audience starts to grow itself and, you know, someone takes your newsletter and they forward it to someone else. That is incredibly powerful because the person they're forwarding it to is now primed to like your content because it comes from a recommendation from someone they trust rather than just seeing it on social media or in an ad or whatever. It's such a great way to start building the audience. One of the mistakes that I see people make a lot, whether it's working with people who are starting new podcasts or building email newsletters or whatever it is, is everybody is always focused on the next subscriber and, and adding the next person to their audience, which you know, fair enough. Not enough people actually look at the subscribers they already have and try to figure out how can I build the ambassadors? How can I encourage these people to go out and do that, especially early on? Because it's like, okay, you've got 10, but you're just focusing on getting to 100. What do you do or, or what can people do with some of those early subscribers, maybe when the numbers aren't huge, but to try to foster some of those, some of those ambassadors and some of those people that are going to go out and really become your loyal early folks and help bring other people into, into your mix? That's such a great question. And there's so many points where, where people make the mistake of focusing on more of the thing that's not the objective. Uh, we've talked about this before. More content, more content. They get so intensely focused on creating more content that they never are actually learning anything about the audience because that's very hard work. I mean, I think if you're paying attention to what works and, and what doesn't, and you're taking an iterative content approach, okay, your content is connecting better, but the hard work is really figuring out what they want to buy, right? And when you talk about creating ambassadors, it's really more than that. Yes, there's that, but there's also just getting the most engaged people to talk to you. So one thing that I never used to do because we used to have blog comments um, and I used to be able to learn so much about what people were feeling and thinking and, and just their perspective on things from that type of environment. Uh, social media to this, to some extent now, it's like, it's still the greatest market research environment there is if you can handle drinking from that fire hose, right? Yeah. Um, but here's the thing that I do now that I think just constantly shocks people. I'll say, hey, hit reply to this email and tell me what you think. And like you, I get just ridiculous amounts of email. Most of it I can delete right away. But, um, but people do. And uh, I learn more from that than anything these days. But here's the thing. I reply to those people and they freak out. They're like, I can't believe you. You're really actually, I, I can't believe this really goes to you. Yep. I'm like, yeah, it does. And it, it is kind of um, a challenge when you have a busy inbox, but there are ways to handle it. You can create special folders where things are routed and all of that. Um, but so them replying is the feedback portion that's so crucial of the three criteria. But the replies to them and the dialogue that sometimes ensues is where the affinity, the, the kind of the bond. And you do that when your audience is smaller because it's manageable. But think about that. And, and I think uh, there are some people that are really good at this. And I probably, you know, somehow just kind of glean this from people who uh, I know Chris Brogan is great at this, you know, just really 
being a human being, God forbid, <laughs> and, and talking to the people who are kind of blessing you with their attention. So when your audience is smaller, maybe at MVA or just before it, take that opportunity while it's manageable to, to talk with people, to correspond with them. Maybe some people will even recommend that you just ask a handful of people to have a phone conversation with you or Zoom or Skype or whatever. Um, it, it seems to be the opposite of the kind of business we're trying to build, which is, you know, more like uh, creator to audience. But the whole idea of this environment from the beginning is interactivity. And that's really the key because that's where you figure things out. But more to your point, that's where people are like, okay, I like this guy. He's my person for this particular topic. And I'm going to tell other people about it. So I don't ask anyone to tell other people that that seems silly to me. People yeah. will be, you know, if they, if the, if it's really there, they'll, they'll feel the need to do it too. Because if you're doing good work and they share good work, it reflects well on them too. Never forget that. Yeah. I, I agree with you so much on that. You know, it's, it's one thing to be creating this audience by providing value. And you do want the people who are consuming your content to feel like they're getting value from you. But there's a next level when you open yourself up to actually connecting with people. And that's what, you know, when someone replies to a newsletter and you reply back, there's now a connection because you're not just the name and the signature of the email. They're now connecting one on one with you. You know, and I've seen this, you know, whether it's, you know, we, when we were doing the assembly call, it was all an audio podcast and we decided to, you know, put them on YouTube. It's like, who is going to want, like, we're just sitting here talking into our microphones, but because it was live and they could see us, there was a different level of connection there, you know, and it's, you know, and then going and, you know, being able to meet people in person, if you have an event or whatever, even if it's just going to coffee with an audience member, like to me, those opportunities for connection, even with just one person can really be valuable because those people are going to spread the word about what you're doing. And at some point, if your audience gets big enough, yeah, you can't do that with, you know, uh, with everybody, obviously. And that's a great problem to have. But man, early on, when you can put yourself in a position to really connect, go the next level, because I, like, I just feel in this day and age, and we found this with the community, people want connection. Yeah, they want your information. They want the value. But if you give them connection, like that's something really valuable. And I, I just think sometimes people overlook the power of that and what it, the cascading impact it can have on growing your audience. Yeah, more and more we're seeing that the connection is the value. I mean, the the context, uh, education and information have become the context that enables meaningful connection. And we've always kind of known this back to 2007 when we launched our first uh, uh, online education program, but it also had a community aspect to it. And the thinking, and I've said this before, that you know people pay for the training and they stay for the the community and the connection. Um, but more and more, it just seems that connection is the thing. People, you know, don't have to discover it after they join. Uh, they crave it from the beginning, and maybe that's an indication of where our society is at this point. Or maybe it's always been that way, but it's just okay now for people to say, hey, yeah, I'm looking for people like me who are interested in this thing or who are doing this thing because it adds meaning and value to my life in addition to the tips and the tricks and the, oh, can you get me a freelancer to do this? All the very practical, pragmatic things that we think people pay money for, you know, we're not that ruthlessly rational. We're emotional. We make emotional decisions and, and human connection is way up there. And I think more and more we have to not only understand that, but embrace it. So you talked about this earlier and I want to pull the thread just a little bit to see if there's any place else it can go. And it, it may be that what you said earlier is as far as it can go. But whenever this conversation comes up and I just had it happen in the Q&A that I did, people want to talk about numbers even just general numbers, you know, and it's, it becomes really hard because as you said, the context is different. How many do you need on your email list to 
start a community, to sell a product, it all it depends on the context. Do you have any general types of numbers, whether it comes to subscribers or what it is that people can look at as a benchmark for whether they've built a minimum viable audience, or is it not even responsible to give numbers because it is so dependent on the context? Um well, I don't think it's irresponsible to talk about numbers, but it's kind of a little bit misguided. And it's interesting to me that the number I used to just give people as a ballpark of 10,000, I, I proved that's not even correct for myself. <laughs> so yeah. um, it it really does depend. But I'm just going to go out there and say somewhere between three to 5,000 people is a minimum viable audience in most cases. Um, there could be other uh, context in which a thousand is is the floor. Um, I can't imagine going having to go higher than five thousand. If you did your homework up front, chose carefully, stuck by your guns, and made sure that you were attracting the type of people that had the highest probability of being engaged with the type of value that you're, you're providing. So when you think about it that way, a minimum viable audience is the result. It's a byproduct of your execution. So we can't uh, eliminate that at all. Um, And I think that's where people can stand to gain the most in this audience building audience first approach to starting or growing a business which is really just being disciplined, taking the time to choose who it is you want to serve. Uh, and that's a very personal thing. It comes down to your own sense of purpose and meaning as well. How do you view the world and how do you find like-minded people? I think that's where the real work is done, but it, it's also human nature to go, okay, how many do I need? And then just kind of put that on the whiteboard and say, that's what I'm working towards when really you need to have your, your eyes off of the whiteboard and on to ways in which you can interact with these people. And you also have to commit to, to putting in the time and showing up reliably enough to build it. Like it can't just be something where it's like, okay, I'll start doing this newsletter weekly once I have X amount of people. Like you have to start doing it before you have the people. To, to get them there. And I think sometimes, or, or what advice would you give to, to someone who maybe has one foot out, one foot in? Like at some point you have to commit to, look, I'm going to serve this audience and I'm going to build this audience. And obviously if it's not working at a certain point, you stop. But I sometimes see people that are doing it halfway and not getting the results that they want. It's like, I mean, if you're not going to show up every week for your audience, how do you expect to build the trust? How do you expect to build you know, the connection that you need to really build this minimum viable audience. So at some point, you're just going to have to buckle down, do the work and stay committed to it for a certain period of time to give it a chance to work, even before the final results are there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I I get the fear. I mean, my biggest fear, it used to be, um, you know, trying to build an audience and no one showing up. But I've been doing it long enough now to where I do my homework so to such a degree up front, which is what I'm trying to encourage and teach people to do in this case, that you're able to go all in because you, you know, you, you're up, the, your percentage of confidence is high. I still have nightmares about launching a product when no one shows up. But again, that's why you spend so much time um, getting to know uh, what's keeping these people up at night? What's the thing that you can help solve for them or at least make better that, uh, again, um, once we get to that point of, uh, developing and launching a product, my degree of confidence is way up there. It's never 100%. So there's, remember, (laughs) yeah, we did this in the fall when we created, uh, uh, seven figure, uh, small intensive Jared's like, man, this is going to be a home run. There's no problem. And I'm like, dude, don't say that. And you're like, what? You, you don't think it's going to work. And I'm like, I do think it's going to work, but quit saying that. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it worked better than even I thought. So, hey, you know. Yeah. And, and see, that's, <laughs> man, you got to under promise over deliver. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, look, a certain amount of paranoia is necessary for any type of audience building. You know, whether it's going back and double checking that email again to make sure that you don't have errors in it or just kind of fearing that something might go wrong so that you do a little bit extra to make sure that you're providing value. I think, you know, that's, you know, you don't want to be over paranoid, but a certain amount of it is, uh, is healthy healthy paranoia (laughs) is, I think it was, uh, Andy Grove, uh, chairman or CEO of Intel at the time who said only the paranoid survive. Um, I thought that was a bit much, but yeah, a, a certain level, whether you want to call it paranoia or, uh, general anxiety disorder that you <laughs> you develop in in just in the process of trying to do something good, but generally, uh, and this is still true today. And there are so many people out there who are so obviously just in it for themselves. If you can sincerely, you know, come across to your audience that hey, I'm putting you first. I'm thinking about you all the time, and I'm trying to deliver. Um, then people respond to that because unfortunately it's, it's not as common as it should be. So you know what they say, Jared, once you can fake sincerity, then you've got it made. Oh, no, oh boy. wait, that was not the way we wanted to end this episode. <laughs> no, no faking, no, no faking people. People expect you, I mean, to be full of BS. They really do. And when they discover over time, hey, maybe this person actually does care about me, then that's where that trust comes in. And then it can it can really be a blessing for a long time. And that's why I think it's good to find opportunities to make yourself vulnerable in front of your audience so they can see you that way and see that you're genuine. You know, whether it's doing a, a live podcast or doing a live event or something or making a mistake and even just saying, you know, hey, I messed this up for this, that, or the other reason. Like, I think sometimes that can go a long way towards letting people know, like, hey, this person's real. You know, there's there's something real going on here. That reminds me of when we first started the Unemployable Initiative, and we kept having all those technical problems, and <laughs> there was nothing you could do about it. We were live without a net, and so you and I just kind of vibed through it, right? You know, and we laughed about it, <laughs> yeah. and, you know... And <laughs> the you're, recordings. Just, oh, you're just trying to make the best of it. Right. But afterwards, everyone was like, man, I love that. That was so cool to see you guys just deal with stuff going wrong. And I was like, really? Yeah. Because I was just trying to make it through with my sense of humor intact. <laughs> yeah. Now they wouldn't have loved it if it kept happening, but they were certainly That's willing to, you know, to indulge yeah. it a couple of times. We did solve see- those problems. <laughs> yes. But I mean, whenever you launch something new, man, you just got to be, you just got to, and uh, to the extent that you can still, oh boy. So ironically, um, ironically, we just had a technical issue. I don't know if you noticed that, but you just cut out. So I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> damn it. We just, we just tempted fate. It's all right. <laughs> it's all right. Go, that's, how, that's how this episode <laughs> should end with five seconds of silence. <laughs> There's a technical issue. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Never talk about well. it live during a recording again. <laughs> I think I think that's a sign right there that we need to wrap this up. <laughs> that is a sign. Any any final thoughts on the process of building a minimum viable audience or knowing when you have one that that we haven't covered yet? Uh, it's an unpopular concept, but patience is the greatest virtue. Um, because getting the right audience is inherently um, a more valuable asset than just some audience. Um, There have been plenty of people who have built an audience but did not succeed in properly developing the right products or services for them. And that kind of is an exercise in futility if you want to look at it from a business building or startup standpoint. So just keep your eye on the ball and realize that the payoff is going to be way more than if you bought a gym. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Seven Figure Small Podcast. We'll be back. I think Brian will be back next week with another interview, and uh, we'll look forward to talking with you then. Take care.